and we're live. Hey. Um, welcome to everyone for a special edition of Chatwater, a uh, fireside chat with our one and only Tim the Cliff Litch Carlson. Um, we're going to be going through the whole journey from the home game to the now streaming game. Uh, we're going to be deep diving into the world, and we're excited to have you come along for the ride. So unlike most nights, uh, I want to start us with the credits because there's not as going to be as easy of a transition. And then we will talk about briefly about the last session. Um, so grab a glass of spider milk and let's celebrate that holiday spirit. Roll that intro. That was a very lovely uh, Christmas intro. Thank you for that, Tim. Um, big thanks to our sponsors and partners. Uh, Legend Crafts Kickstarter is live and fully funded. Uh, only a few days left for you to back this amazing project. Um, if you back the project, use our code Blackwater, um, and you get free art and customization on the back. You could get your character name, class, logo, or even the Blackwater logo. All designs done by the amazing Tiana, our campaign artist. Also, Silverwing Arm Armory uh, for paper products for all your RPG needs. Uh, use the code BLACKWATER at checkout to get 10% off. Uh, and thank you so much to Tiana and Keisha, our art and dice pa patrons. Um, check our Instagram uh, for the, well, no, it's maybe not on the Instagram yet, but we have peaked some early um, peaks at the newest art for the level 15 stuff from Tiana. And it is so good. So um, good. <laughs> I want to get printed a huge one frame mm. um, of the sneak peek, there's a group shot. And it is warms my heart. Um, and Keisha, who makes the most stunning dice, uh, we have we use them on the show. Everyone has a personalized set. So uh, get in contact with them. Uh, if you want anything, I know Tiana is opening up her commissions again in the new year. Um, merch, we have merch, which is crazy. Um, I recently got my uh, Blackwater sweater and it is a very comfy and very special to me. Um, so if there's anyone you want to get a late Christmas gift for, it won't be in time for Christmas, but you can do like a picture of it or whatever. Uh, head to the store, uh, our Teespring store, um, and please send us photos of you guys rocking your merch. Um, support and donations. Thank you to everyone who subscribes to us here uh, and re-upping every month. Uh, it doesn't automatically re-up, so if you are on Prime, you have to do that. Uh, we also started a Kofi. If you type uh, exclamation mark support or exclamation mark donate in the chat, it will give you all of the information for that. Um, we've got some exciting things planned. Um, we want, we were hoping to get them up and going sooner, but COVID has really thrown a wrench in everyone's plans. Um, so it's going to take a little bit longer, but they are very exciting and we are very excited to um, continue to improve the show. Um, our Lore Club, our amazing mod at the Experience Network is doing some fantastic things. He is one of the driving forces behind it and I know it warms M's heart to have people as passionate about the lore as she and my is. Too. And me too. I mean, it warms all of our hearts, but M is M is lore obsessed. So yeah. you guys are feeding her. Um, like Tim <laughs> feeds on Cliff on Liches, mm -hmm. uh, Cliff Liches, M feeds on lore. So if you want to get involved, lore type, she is a lore lich. <laughs> Exclamation mark lore in the chat to find a, a link to the Google form and get in contact with, uh, with him from there and join in the fun. We have some exciting things planned for the Lore Club as well. Um, this week's programming, Wednesday, the werewolf is back. Uh, I'm very excited I get yeah. to join. Um, Wednesday, we will be doing a Home for the Holidays uh, game, joined by some of our old friends and new. Uh, M is back to GM this one uh, for a holiday adventure that's going to be simultaneously spooky and festive. Uh, we'll be playing at 8 p.m. PST. And then, of course, we're back for the first main campaign stream on Saturday, January 2nd at 8 p.m. It is, yeah. it is a, it's a, well, let's talk about the last episode. It's an interesting yeah. place that we've left off. I mean, it, it, we tied up a big storyline and um, it's one of those moments where the world is sort of open ahead of them. 
Um, yeah. Uh, when you when you planned Rysel, yeah. How much of that when you originally planned it was like what were the chances in the beginning that he was going to be redeemable? Because I feel like letters drove that pretty hard. I mean, yeah. I, I like I, I think I wanted to approach it that like he wasn't because that was the thing like the party had this relationship with him beforehand and and i i definitely and especially with how some of the interactions have been going as of late i was like i don't and i it generally like i don't want a villain to be entirely evil like like because they never see themselves as evil generally that's my opinion of of good villains is that like they really believe that they are justified and that's like it's just that sort of path like it's like with batman it's like a lot of batman villains are just version like the uh, the opposite side of batman like like bad yeah, things like happen one, to them one different choice yeah it's just like it's just a choice that they made along the line and like and they're just so far down that road that it's like they're that it consumes them and so with rysel it was like i tried to think about it of like yeah if you were stuck in a ring for thousands and thousands of years and the last that you knew before you got stuck in that ring was that all your people had been killed by another race of uh, like another race of people. You would just you would just stew in that anger for so long. But it wasn't like he wasn't so far gone that it couldn't be like. And it, as he like saw things and and like was in Illyria and like saw them like it was like he'd obviously connected with them in some way. But then it was like when Finnan showed him and like when he was able to gain more context, it was like, oh, shit. Like there was like there was an opening there and, and the party decided to to go for it. It was like and it wasn't, you know, even like I didn't no roles came up, like no persuasion roles, because I was like, I didn't feel like it needed it. It was like I his arguments were persuasive what Finnan was doing was like, and that's why I was like, you know, what do you show him? Like what, it's still his choice as to what's happening, but it was like, yeah, these, these are things that would work like, and, and that, so it was, it was very fun. And, and like, I, I toyed with a long time about like how to, like how it would get to that place and like trying to sort of figure out how to thread the needle in a way of like, of, you know, that like he how everything was kind of set up and and what that moment would look like and and I thought about delaying it like there was part of me that was like you know maybe they will have to sort of figure out who he is in the city and there'll be some intrigue and stuff like that and then I was like to me that almost felt like they were expecting that so I was like I want to flip the script I want, I want to be able to like put it in front of them and be like no they know who they know Volketh they like him he's like he they totally trust him and like to to like kind of put it back on them to to have to try to justify what they're doing and you know kind of put them on their heels but oh i was screaming at them the entire time to check the the fingers of the other people who were there <laughs> they were so focused on yeah. on uh, uh i forget the t his title the uh, uh the fractured consort the fractured consort i was i was like no it's not him you guys it's someone yeah. else um but uh, yeah. yeah, I I what I think is so beautiful about especially how that whole thing played out was just it was a moment of growth for both Rysel to realize his mistake and to attempt to fix it, and also for Finnan to try a different tact than he usually tries. Yeah. Um, so it was this really beautiful sort of like combination of the two, um, which I thought was was really fantastic. Um, one of my favorite moments from the last stream was um, letters putting the ring on and doing the doot, 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 doot. And then your delayed doot, doot response um, yeah. was just, it's it's little things like that in your storytelling that make it from a regular story to making it something truly cinematic. Because you can see him do it in like in your mind's eye. You can see him wait for no response. And just as he's about to leave, he gets the, the doot, doot. Um, it was, it, it was, it's a, it's such a touching moment for me, especially because letters, letters so badly wants to see the good in people these days after everything he's gone through. So for him to be 
correct um, yeah. in this assumption of who Rysel was, was I think one of the sort of best story beats so far. Um, this, that was the interesting thing to me about this whole arc. Cause I, I mean, it's, I don't know if the arc's done. I mean, I don't want to be too presumptuous, but this sort of like Rysel arc was the stakes. Um, I don't want to say genocide stakes are lower, but the stakes felt slightly lower than they did with Velsum because Velsum was like world destruction. And yeah, this was, was a little bit smaller of a scope. Yeah, it was, but, it was, and it was somewhat removed, right? Cause they didn't have any, like, it, there wasn't really any drow in their immediate circle. Like there wasn't yeah. any sort of personal connection of the, like, like, oh no, like, you know, one of the council is a, a drow or, or Kamehameha is a drow. Like, you know, it wasn't like a personal connection in a way. So it, it like, it, it did like, the stakes were different. They were a bit removed. Um, but what I loved about it was it, it meant more emotionally to a lot of the characters than the Velsum one did. I, I mean, not necessarily for uh, Nepenthe because in, in the Velsum one, she was completing what she believes to be her purpose as, as the high priestess. Um, but for everyone, like for, for Finnan and for Letters, it, it was a very sort of like uh, emotional one. There was a lot of like personal emotions at stake and like, and division in the group. Um, I, I'm interested, I'm curious to see how uh, Nepi handles um, failing for the first time. Like, I don't want to like assume too much, but like her whole thing was to protect the Orphea and it, it all worked out for the best, I guess we think. Um, but at the same time, like she did, didn't do what she set out to do. Um, yeah. I don't think that happens to her very often. So we didn't see it play out necessarily in this session, but I was like, I'm curious to see how she, how it changes how she interacts because she's one to really take up a cause. Um, mm -hmm. Especially I think now that her, her main mission is done. Um, what about this last episode? Did you like anything particular stand out for you? It was, uh, I, I loved like, the the moments after as well like in that kind of like having a moment where blackwater could celebrate we haven't had like they have been going from you know adventure to adventure and there's been there is very little downtime in their adventure on the whole but it was like and sometimes it just doesn't it doesn't work out because like you know especially after like a big battle or whatever there's like you know they're all exhausted and bloody and and all that stuff so it's like they there isn't really time, but because of the way everything played out, there was like, they did get a moment of, they just got to sit and celebrate their accomplishment. And that was really fun. Like we haven't had like, uh, let's go drink in a tavern <laughs> session for oh, quite a while. And it was really fun to let them kind of let their characters, the fun side of their characters, like we see it in, in interactions and things like that for them to just really, you know, embrace it and, and have fun with it and, uh, and just kind of let loose. I think, I think generally, um, the, that's a sort of like a, I don't want to say a pitfall of most D and D groups, but it's a pitfall of kind of the D and D structure that's generally used where it's, yeah. it's, you know, mission from to mission, to mission, to mission, to drive yeah. a storyline, but generally you don't get those moments of downtime. And that's sort of, I feel like where the the character development really happens because people have a chance to take stock of what's occurred and then adjust their character appropriately. Uh, I'm a big fan of the fact that uh, Yana and Clack seem to be getting along so well. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't want to say, I don't want to say I thought it was a joke in the beginning, but I felt like it was almost like a, you know, like a little, yeah. oh, well, Clax, you know, Clax got a crush on you. And it's sort of like a weird, like, oh, you know, he's this weird guy. Um, but now, like, the more we get to know him and the more she gets to know him, the the fact that there is, it's no longer like a someone fawning over someone who shows no interest. There's sort of like a little bit of like a, oh, maybe they're interested back, I think is a really great um, dynamic. Yeah, it's a fun, it's a very fun like, and it's fun for me as a DM to get to connect with, with Yana in that way, and like, and to have and in with a 
with an NPC that like, it is a fun relationship to explore in kind of this like, and I like, I very much, you know, I, I uh, like I feed off what, you know, I'm getting from, from Yana and stuff like that. And it's like, it's fun to just like, let it play out very organically. Like it really, like, I, I don't plan any, I'm not like this session I'm gonna go for. It's just like, it just happens how it happens. And it's been very fun to see those, those moments kind of organically occur and then just roll with them and see what happens next. It's like, it's very, very fun. I mean, I do need to know, Tim, do you have a flirting problem? I mean, you introduced, you introduced only- You couldn't couple, help it last session. I mean, you only introduced a couple of NPCs and both of them were incredibly flirtatious. <laughs> um, letters interaction with, okay, I, I'm gonna, her name is so close it's, to, it's Nepantha. to Nepantha. To Nepantha, it's Serpenthus. Serpenthus. Um, that whole interaction was amazing. Um, partially because I love anytime you flirt with letters with anyone that's not his type, because he's yeah. made it very clear what his yeah. type is. Um, and his, he's the, the definition of that, like nice guy who tries to let you know right away that he's not interested, <laughs> but then also it kind of like the, the moment where you, where he described it as a professional relationship like we, we, I don't, I think it's pretty fair to say we've all been in a situation where someone's made it like clear and you're like, <laughs> oh, ah, uh, yeah, of right. course, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Um, and then also, you know, with Finn and, uh, and, yeah. and the girl that, that leads him to the <laughs> tavern. I mean, it's just, you are, you were in fine form um, with the flirting. Um, I don't, like a, that one would, uh, like with Finn was like, yeah, I mean this this guy has just yeah he's with, he's a pop he's like, a fucking Justin Bieber he's a folk I mean, hero like all of a sudden and it's like yeah, of course like of course you know he's gonna like if he's out there kind of looking for some help like of course he's gonna get it like and uh, yeah it was fun to play with that and and you know I, and like just kind of get like throwing out those opportunities and whether they take them or not it's like you're neither here nor there but it's like it's fun to roll with them when they come up I did enjoy the sort of like. Um, <laughs> there, there was a sort of a uh without assuming too much about her character the, the the fact that the second head phased her so little because it wasn't occurring at that moment told me a lot about her as a person um oh this is not something i have to deal with okay yes <laughs> i am still interested <laughs> um but yeah the, i mean it was a it was a fantastic session it was a great way to uh, end us into the new year. I was fully expecting you to put almost like a, a, a time jump at the end, um, just because it had that sort of feel to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I know there are some other pressing issues that need to be be dealt with. Um, but talking about more sort of the world as a whole, mm. it's it's crazy to me that this is the first campaign that you're ever DMing. I mean, yeah. It, you're such a practiced hand at it, um, or at least you appear to be. Um, I think it's fair to say, I don't know if we've talked about it, or maybe you've talked about it before on, on behind the screen, but it, do you find that it's a lot of your um, improv background? Do you think that gives you that sort of strength? Totally. And like, I, I have DM'd, like, while this is the first one I started with, I have while running this, I have run, I have another campaign that I run less frequently. Um, and then there was another kind of side campaign that I ran within that as well. Um, and various other kind of one shots here and there. But I definitely think that like, my improv background as like, and the type of improv that I do very much lends itself to narrative long form. And so like, I, and I've been doing it for 15 years now, like, it's so like narrative structure is so drilled into my head that like it's it is it feels like second nature a lot of the time so like you know and then pulling those things apart or like being able to look back at what I've already what we've already built and be like okay I want to pull that thread forward is also like it kind of runs in with improv and especially long form improv where it's just like using what you've already established that and like giving yourself a lot so that when you do look back, there's lots to pull from. Um, and like 
with D and the like collaborative nature of it, it's like, it's not just me. It's like, I can pull from any of these details that anybody has set up. And I'm very fortunate that all of the players come to the table with so much, so much, like so much character, so much story of their own that it's like, there is, it's such a rich, um, it's such a rich basket of things that I can I can use to to weave the narrative forward and push the narrative forward in in fun and interesting ways, but yeah, it's like, and the like comfortability with like not knowing what's going to happen next, or you know having like or only knowing to a certain point of like I'm going to do this and then we'll see which way it goes, <laughs> like that is doesn't phase me and I enjoy it actually. It's like, I very much enjoy um, being in that position where it's like, where the players surprise me or um, or they come up with something way better than, and it happens all the time where like, they suggest something that is just a way better idea. And then it's just like, yeah, that's the thing that it is. <laughs> and they never have to know about any idea that I had or was planning and just kind of rolling with rolling with it. So, I mean, it, with, with, it sounds like a lot of the stuff then is you coming up with stuff on the spot, drawing from the past, but I mean, you must plan ahead somewhat. How, how far yeah. do you typically plan ahead? Like it's, and I mean, of course, of course it's not like de always detailed planning, mm -hmm. but you have like, I guess, story beats or arc yeah. beats. Yeah. Yeah. So I try to think of like, I work a lot, like I, I tend to work, especially with the bigger arcs, I try to work with kind of themes and, or like, or, or kind of general ideas and then work smaller. Like, um, I, like I can't, I can't get into it too much, but like, cause it's, it's already heading in that direction, which is great. Like things are already starting to happen in, in this sort of g bigger idea that I have for the like, um, the kind of larger narrative, like if you were to sort of step back and look well, at like let me re happening. Re let me rephrase the, the question then a little bit. Um, do you, when you, how far into the home game did mm. you sort of go, oh, I know, like, was there a point during the home game or a point that you went, oh, I know where this, I want this to end? Uh, or, like the, the entire campaign? The like entire the campaign, end? yeah. Did you, I would did you have like a moment where you're like, if we can, or if everything goes to plan, like this is kind of where we're heading or you don't think like that? No, I, I don't have like, I, I wouldn't say I have, I have ideas of ways that it could go at the very end, but there's so much between then and like, and now that it's like, I know it will change. Like I have, I like now as we're kind of getting into the higher levels, I have a broader idea of like certain elements that will probably be in play as part of the end game um and certain things that will feed into that like by now that's like that's that's starting yeah, I to mean, become clearer level wise yeah you know, not always story wise but level wise we would be three quarters of the mm -hmm. way done so i mean you know that makes sense yeah. that you would have sort of end in sight or at least yeah. you know direction but but at the beginning, when I first like, cause this was a, it was originally a one shot. They were all level five. It was like, there was a werewolf in the town and they had to deal with it. And it was like this cult of the moon and, um, and everyone had so much fun. It was on a new year's Eve, which I highly recommend for anyone looking for something to do on new year's Eve, grab five friends, uh, have a small party cause small parties are where it's at. Not right now. Cause on zoom, you know, but do it on zoom. Um, and uh, just put together one shot. And especially with people who've never played, it's like a very easy way to be like, that's oh, New Year's Eve, like, let's try this new thing. Um, but from that, we all really enjoyed it. So we decided to keep playing. And I like, I really fell down the rabbit hole of planning, like in that first, especially that first arc and um, the first kind of bigger arc. And up till, I guess they were probably about level eight, maybe nine by the end of it, I think it level eight. Um, but I, I, I like built, the Wolfar, the continent, I've made all the towns and the cities and filled them all out with all this information, which I look back and, and it's great to have that as a reference. Um, 
but it's funny going back through some of those early notes and like looking at like different city descriptions and being like, oh, I didn't use that. Didn't use that. Like, cause I gave myself like story hooks in each one and like, you know, some I've sort of picked and, and pulled forward, but a lot of them I haven't used. And, but I really like, I did a lot. I think I planned too much personally. Like if I were to start it, like on the next campaign, I would do it a bit differently. Um, and I kind of really, I had a really clear sense of that first arc, but what happened was as players will always do, just things like little hooks just get missed. So little bits of information get missed. And instead of like, you know, and we've talked about this on, on behind the screen, but instead of just moving them to a new spot or, 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 you know, changing it, which like, as I grew as a DM, I got more comfortable doing or, or massaging things that way. Um, pieces didn't really fall into place until way later. Now, when it did come together, it was really, really satisfying because there was a bunch of like the pin dropped and it was just like, oh, 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 oh. Like it was really cool to watch, but it took a long time to get there. So it was like, it was kind of boring for a bit. It was like a lot of like players trying to sort of feel their way through the story and figure out like, what is exactly like, why, where do we fit into this? Like, it seems important, but we don't have enough information because they were figuring, like, they were discovering all the stuff about Caradoc and the, like, you know, this ancient civilization and, and all this stuff with the Caraxians. And, but it just took a while for, for all the pieces to fall into place. So I've gotten better now at like, I do plan ahead and like, it's more sort of like, I will give, you know, whatever the uh, antagonists are, or are doing in the world, I'll know what their arc is at any given time. Like I know what their plan is. I, I know what the Matron of Vengeance's plan is. I know what Brycell's plan was. I like, I know that, I know what he's doing. And then, you know, and then it's just about where does that intersect with the players from session to session. And, um, and then I have a different way of, like dungeons I build differently when, you know, when they went through the tomb of the Raven Queen or when they were under Barm Witch and what was the most recent one? Um, the Money Hole. I like, I build those almost like modules. Like I, I do a map for myself and then I number it all out and then I put encounters and what's in there. And that way it's like, I just find that easier for myself to run the actual thing because it's like, I know they're going to explore all these places. So it's easier for me to kind of lay it out. Cause not, it's not necessarily like, if they don't go in that room, I can move whatever information may be there. Let's, but ultimately that encounter is gonna be the same. Let's talk a little bit about the money hole because the money hole was something that when we talk about things plotted out ahead of time, the money hole was something you put on their radar very early on. Yeah. Um, did you always plan for it to go where it went or did you think, oh, they'll go solve this and I don't need to think too far ahead? Uh, it was it was originally and for a very very long time always going to be a side quest. It was always just a, like this is here like you want to have kind of a fun den dungeon delve. And as they left it for longer and longer, I started to think about like okay like you know knowing that like Task was doing this thing, I was like okay originally he was just like a dragon. It was just you know like if they had gone in at level seven or whatever, it's like he just would have been an adult dragon. It would have been a hard fight, but it would have been cool. Uh, and then I was like, okay, well, they've left it for longer. So it's like, no, maybe he's an ancient dragon now. And then it's like, they left it for really long. I was like, well, he's now amassed a lot. So like, what's his ultimate goal? If he's just doing like, like, if he's going to amass this massive, massive horde at some point, like there has to be, what's the next step? And then it was like, oh, I guess he's going to like, he's going to try to, Oh, like supplant Tiamat. Yeah, because he's got all this wealth. Like it would it would attract her attention. Like he can get her attention now. And then by the time they got there, it was like, it's already happened. You're too late. <laughs> like he's already done it. And it was very fun to kind of like, because I would every few, like, you know, every few months or like as soon as they would get kind of close to like, because they talk about it every once in a while. And then I'd start thinking, I'd be like, okay, like if we're, if they're going to go and pursue that, like what would be happening? Because I kind of knew the general like layout of like, there was going to be Duragar and, and that kind of stuff. 
Um, and as they got into higher levels, I was like, oh God, like how am I gonna make this still challenging and interesting and fun? Um, but, uh, but yeah, so it was, it was very, it was a fun exercise for me because it was also something that like, Emma knew that something was going on. Like Emma knew that like, she was like, I know it's not good in there. Like, I know there's something going on. And she knew that like, but I couldn't tell her anything. And she would just be like, I want to just, I want to know what's going on. <laughs> It was very funny. So how did how did Erkin come into play in all of this? Like, how did you, where did Erkin get introduced and then how, when did you decide to tie him to this storyline? So Erkin, this is a prime example of improvised characters that just kind of spin into larger figures. Like this was the same thing with, it's very funny how many characters have come out of, like how many pivotal characters in this campaign have come out of uh, improvised moments. Um, Clack being, probably one of the top like I have it in my notes like Clack was just going to be a patch in the scar who was a jeweler and then when they like found this patch that was running away uh like I was like trying to because they asked his name because I didn't think they were going to save him like I didn't think they were going to go out and it was literally just going to be like there was going to be a patch that was going to get eaten to highlight that there's fucking spiders out there <laughs> and they're like no we got to save this thing and I was like oh shit so I was like I just gave him the name Clack so I was like, cause it was in my notes and I was like, ah, oh, his name's Clack. And then it just like, it, he's just become this much bigger thing. So Erkin was originally, they were looking for platinum and uh, to make these rings for warding bond, I believe. And I didn't want like, especially when they're trying to find kind of rare spell components, I like to make it a bit of a challenge. So it's not just like, I'm not, I'm not just gonna give this to you. It's out there, but you have to go and find it. And especially because they wanted a number of rings. They didn't want just two, like, I think they wanted four. So I was like, yeah, you're looking like, platinum's hard to come by. It's like, it's not, it's not everywhere. And, uh, and so eventually like Finn, uh, I think Adam rolled a natural 20 and on his investigation check to find a place where he could like find platinum because they checked the jewelers and they didn't have any or enough. And so I, I came up with this character who was a natural tone. I was like, okay, yeah, you find a guy who's like a cash for platinum guy, like a cash for gold guy. And I, I just ran with it. Like I wanted to make him this sort of weird, like, cause like who would do that? Like who, like, I mean, cause that's how I think about people who are cash for gold people. I'm like, what is your deal? I like, I don't, I don't understand it. So I just assume it's weird, which is bad, but I'm sure it's a very legitimate business. Um, but uh, so I was like, okay, is it going to be weird? You, listen, listen, our, the percentage of audience, I think that are involved in the cash to gold. I don't want to offend like, those people. You know, I don't want to, I don't know what you do. People do for money. It's that's totally your business. I mean, generally gold is worth cash. So at some point yeah, 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 it should yeah, yeah. be exchanged. So yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. it's like their stores are weird. Like, I, I don't know. It seems the, I think the reason they have such a bad rep is the commercials on TV are always the most insane TV commercials. Exactly. They approach, they approach the exchange of gold for cash the same way people who sell secondhand cars do. And this was I think, this guy. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he lived in like, he was in like a stone building, but it was almost like a bunker. Like everything was like, like uh, barred up. The windows were all barred up and he was behind this like thick glass. And he was this like kind of weird dwarvish dude. And they were like immediately suspicious of him, which just made me play into that more. I was like, they were like, this guy is weird. And I was like, yeah, he's really weird. <laughs> and he was really obsessed with buying platinum at a markup. Like he would, he was offering like one and a half times the amount of money. And they were like, that's extra weird. And they wanted to get platinum from him, which was like, very difficult because he didn't want to part with it eventually he did part with some um so hold on they went to the cash for gold place and tried yeah. to buy gold <laughs> yeah exactly and so they were like i'm just they were very obsessed with this guy and then i was like i started to think afterwards because they were like again they uh, a couple of times went back to him and sold him platinum that they had gotten to make more money and i was like okay like what is this guy's deal like what like what why is he his collecting all yeah. this his platinum and then i worked him into uh the one shot the one shot that took place before the dawn war so thousands of years before 
because I was like, this is going to make them even weirder. Like this is an even. So like, when you, when you do something like that, when you work him into a one shot that's taking place thousands of years before, is that your way of just like, for lack of a better term, fucking with your wife? Like, is that like a, I'm going to drop this name and she's going to lose her shit. And like, I'll figure out the rest afterwards. No, but there, mainly there was some planning to it. Okay. But, it's, but par- I, it's partially to fuck with your wife. I do like doing that because I know that she will get it. Yeah. So I do like putting in those those threads, whether they're direct or not, because I know that she will get it. And I find it very satisfying as a storyteller. And now um, Laura Club will as well. Because now we have, uh, like, we found uh, people who feel the same way as Anne, which yeah, like, I, just, I mean, that's... I'm obsessed with that. I, I do it all the time. Like, I, I enjoy that kind of like, because it, it is right. Like it's a living world, like, you know, things continue on and, and that kind of stuff. And, and I pepper them in because I enjoy it. And sometimes they get noticed, sometimes they don't. Um, but, uh, but with Erkin, I was like, I knew that he was like, I know he's not a dwarf. Like he, he's something else. I uh, admittedly did not land on that he was a Rakshasa until later, but I was like, I knew I wanted him to be someone who lived either a very long time or almost indefinitely. And so I, I worked him into, into the Adventures in Amin-K, which was kind of Velsum's origin story. And it was a one shot with like 15 people. It was insane. It was very fun, but it was like very chaotic. And so like the, the fact that any lore got picked up from that, even though I did work in quite a bit, well, is amazing to me and a testament to how incredible Emma is. Um, but uh, but then, like, I was like, okay, if he's obsessed with, like, who else is obsessed with wealth in this way? And I was like, obviously, he's got to be working for Task. It, it, like, once it clicked, it was like, oh, yeah, of course he is. Of course he's working for Task. And then it was fun to work him in into another one shot where he was in uh, Emma's birthday one shot sigil. Um, and basically, like, because it was at the point where it was like, task is about to ascend. Like, he's trying to now get people on board. Like, wh- I can promise you wealth. Like, you just, you listen to me, you follow, you follow this guy, you're going to be rich. And, uh, and so it was very fun to kind of have this character then pop up again. And just, again, lend to the mystery of, like, what is going on? And it also was a way of, of highlighting that like once they sort of put together that he was with Task, it was like, oh, maybe there is something going on that we need to go and explore. And I think, yeah, I think uh, if I think if they had made the connection between Task, Erkin, and the money hole earlier, yeah. that would have definitely given them a direction, more direction to go to sort of solve that. Yeah. Um, but I think it happened the best way that it, that it could have, uh, I don't think it could have, like, it was such a, it's such a great, um, story, story thread. And we, we don't, we don't know where, where it's going to go. Um, but were there any sort of other moments that the group did things like, didn't like, didn't explore the money hole? Were there any other moments that the group did things that really caught you off guard? Yeah, there's been a few, like, um, <laughs> a great one is when they uh, decided to go throw the um, the hell armor into the lava. And um, and I was like, okay, yeah, sure. Roll that teleport. And then they fucked up the teleport. And it was like, <laughs> that was a great one of just like, oh, now I really am like, now I'm, I'm really way off, off book. And, uh, and luckily, like I kind of pulled from something that I had not entirely planned, but loosely, I'd given myself an outline for a path they could have taken if they had decided to go to Cinderfall to find one of the, the, um, um, one of the seals instead of Manta. Um, so I was like, I knew that there was essentially kind of a dungeon in within the within the volcano and so it was like okay they'll i'll take them there um but that was another one where it was just like and then like and then then throwing armor from hell into lava i was like yeah okay sure and it disappears under the lava and it's gone you don't see it anymore (laughs) and and that kind of stuff and and like 
the teleport definitely has been a, or sometimes when they, like most times when they decide to go to the plane of air, um, she is just reflecting my own like, oh, <laughs> hi, okay, you're here, great. <laughs> Um, cause they love to play shift and they, at least they, I know now that they pretty much only go, but there's been times when they've gone to the plane of air and been like, we're going to go take a look around at the market. And it's like, I don't have a freaking market prepared, <laughs> like, <laughs> but I have some now, but, um, but that kind of stuff or like, uh, you know, they'll, one of them will want some obscure thing. Like I want to go find a shirt guy. I need a shirt guy. I'm like, yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. <laughs> it's yeah, like, of course. I'll make you a shirt guy right now. Um, but yeah, and the, like the teleport in, in Gar Yang, I, I didn't expect them to do that. I didn't expect it to work either, um, which was also I like, mean, like 25% chance. The teleport worked. It didn't yeah. necessarily that was all the thing. work. I mean, it depends who you ask. Yeah. If you ask Sean, it worked for sure. Um, but Let's talk about that teleport for a second. They skipped over a lot of travel. Yeah. Um, were there things in there that you had wanted them to learn that they skipped or was it generally, uh, were you gonna give them a level up before or? I don't think so. I don't think they would have leveled up before. Um, potentially like if they had, depending on the route that they had taken, but there was a chance. But most likely, most likely not. But there was definitely like information that could have helped them, especially in the Moros Vike fight or against the Crystal Born and the Elders and like learning about how the culture worked and picking up clues about the refugees and where Save Valeria was and how to get there um, and stuff like that. Like, cl like clues that could have, information essentially that could have helped them uh, with dealing with Moro's Vike and also information about, and like a clue about Say Valiri because they didn't really know anything. They didn't even know it was there no. until Finan, like until Rulavan was like, I can feel other, like I can feel more people. I can feel souls out there. Um, Cause that was the thing for me. I was like, I, I knew it existed I had like I had given clues, but like the map that they had gotten from Fangren's study, it had all it had information on it that like if they had used it in their journey, they would have been like, oh, oh, like it it could have helped them. Um, but again, it's like like by doing what they did, they just put themselves in a more dangerous situation which was very fun. Like, cause Gar, like that was the thing I really enjoyed about Gar Yang and I have enjoyed about this place is that it is a dangerous place. It is like, it's unforgiving. And to then see them put themselves in more danger knowingly or unknowingly is like, it puts them in a place where it's like, oh yeah, maybe we can't just charge in. Maybe we can't just do things the way we've been doing it. Like we are powerful, but there are still things that are more powerful and we are not invincible. So that was like, it was definitely, cause they, they haven't been in a place, they've been in danger before for sure, but not in a place that's like consistently dangerous and not letting up, I think, anyways. No, I think, uh, and I think it was one of the most interesting fights that we've had in the whole campaign so far was, um, the fights with the giants immediately after the teleport, because it's not yeah. often that we see the group go into a confrontation pretty much spent. Um, and the sort of getting down off the mountain really sort of tapped them in as far mm -hmm. as magic and, and exhaustion and all that stuff goes. So it was one of the few times where it was like, you know, they weren't rested, they weren't prepared, they were completely caught off guard. Um, and it, there was a sense of, uh, like the wheels coming off a little bit in that fight mm -hmm. of like, just trying to, it went from like, how do we win this fight? Which they did before Yana got the mansion up, but it went from how do we win this fight to how do we survive until the mansion is up? Yeah. There was a definite feeling of, of that. Um, which I think 
is is kind of one of the cool things that that you did where you were like you know you could have chosen not to throw that at them at that time but you were like you know what there's got to be consequences to making those decisions yeah um speaking of the mansion mm. the mansion fight with Velsum was mm. another one of those pivotal moments where um the fight itself wasn't necessarily as big as the initial fight with Velsum, yeah. but the consequences of you using Cali against the rest of the group was, you know, obviously has been um, like transformative for her. It definitely yeah. changed how she played. Um, was that something you planned to do or was that like, a, oh, what would like, what spells do I have? Or were you like, I'm going to go into this and plan to use it somebody else? It wasn't, uh, I, I knew the spells that he had at his disposal, but it was more trying to think of, um, it was me through Velsum trying to think tactically because that was one of my favorite things about Velsum and a lot of the enemies they're now coming up against that, that like know them better, but especially Velsum he knew them he studied them like he understood how they worked he was very very smart and to play an enemy that is intelligent and understands his enemy was very fun and to get them in a position where it was like i know that like that callie poses a big threat and i know that she's vulnerable to this i can use that to my advantage i can like you know having Finnan off the board was not planned, but it's, he used it to his advantage. Like, it's like, I know that I, if I can get, you know, the other wizard out of here, I don't have to worry about my spells being counterspelled. So it's like, what, are, what, like, who can I take off the board to make this as straightforward as I can to give me the best odds of winning. And, and also the, like his heel was that like, he also wanted to kill Kokanee. So it was like, that was also like Kokanee and Depenta he wanted to kill. And that ultimately was like, you know, kind of his undoing because it was like, he, he needed to do that. Like that was his, you know, his flaw in a way is that like he, he got too focused on them. And so like thinking tactically like that. And when I had the idea for the mansion fight, it was only like, it was a session before like it wasn't something I had been planning for a long time. It was an opportunity that I saw that I was like, oh, this would be so interesting. <laughs> like what, like, cause just thinking about the, like the ramifications of that, of like, yeah, like part of, part of this thing is inside of the wizard, like has control over the wizard's source of power. Like, what could he do with that? Like, how could he use that to his advantage? And when so, I thought about it, I was like, oh man, I got to do that. So and when was, you say it was something that kind of like, came up or was like fortuitous at the time are you saying you decided that session that it was going to happen the session before like after the session before i had the idea that week before yeah. the session but so it wasn't know... improvised in the session oh, okay so it wasn't like you were in the session and you were they went into the mansion and no. you were like this is perfect no i had the idea because i knew they were going to use the mansion and i was like oh like if it works out like if they use the mansion and it works out. And I like, I, I didn't, man, I didn't want to manipulate the situation to make them use the mansion. But I also was like, you know, I tried to think about it, like, okay, what would motivate them to use the mansion? And having Oftish be like, I don't think it's necessarily safe that you stay here, which made sense to me. It was like, yeah, no, they're like, they have brought threats and, and, you know, um, Tempo Philanus is not really set up for this it's not like a war temple so it made sense and i didn't but like i didn't want to force them into it it did kind of unfold that way and especially stuff with like finnan and stuff like that it was like it unfolded that way and it was like oh man it was very satisfying to see it come together and no it's yeah, cool yeah. that you it's cool that you got to sort of like um almost metagame the fight because the character was in that yeah. position i mean it it made sense for the character to plan to pick the right moment to use his knowledge. Um, but it's cool to be able to be like, um, 
usually when they when they encounter someone they're not intimately knowledgeable about them you know what i mean but he was um yeah and the same thing would have gone with with Rysel, another enemy that was very familiar with the party and the tactics of some of those members like he knows letters really well he knows what he does he knows how to work around that like he would have known how to counter that in a way um you know because he's familiar with the party and like having villains like that or or you know like it doesn't even necessarily have to be somebody that is that close to them but like you get into especially in higher levels of play the enemies you know are generally smarter and they know how to survive and they're you know they're just as powerful as the party for a reason so so with that came the sort of end of uh yana's source of magic with her spooky pants um how did you sort of I'm assuming then that was a conversation you then had with Jen about how to change her type of magic or like, how do you go about that usually? Yeah, it was, that one's something that Jen kind of came to me with. And I had noticed too, that she had not been using her necromancy abilities. She wasn't bringing up skeletons and stuff like that. And, and so I reached out to her being like, you know, you would like, you're not using these abilities and she was like yeah like it, i'm i want to like she wasn't totally she wanted to be a necromancer still but she like we i threw some discussion we did like we realized we wanted to kind of approach it in a different way and she was feeling like it does the necromancer is not the most exciting class when you get to a certain point it's like it, there are uh limitations to it in a way and like, I, there's a lot of interesting role play that can happen with it, um, but it does as a class, like just functionally, it's like, it kind of peters out a bit. Um, but she still liked the idea of being a necromancer. And so we talked uh, quite a bit of back and forth of like, how do we change that? And it's an ongoing process. We're still like, her and I are still working on, on kind of fully fleshing out because it is kind of, a new school in a way um and we're kind of fleshing out what that looks like and what it means but the like the way that i've been thinking about it and with the sort of like being able to uh can tap into the ether as it were um because that's like the whole idea of ether i find really cool it's like a victorian like um uh what's the word i'm looking for occultism thing um but like the idea that it's like you know she can see the the kind of the energy that connects everything, the strings that connect everything, and then being able to manipulate that. And, you know, so it's like, it's a version of the necromancy school, but it takes it out of that kind of like grim, sort of like evil place. And, and, you know, and puts it into a like, it's not about, you know, manipulating the dead, it's about, you know, calling on, on the like, the, the energy that binds all things to manipulate to my advantage or or to my like to help me and it's been fun kind of thinking about it that way of like how to adapt certain things and and what we want to change and tweak and a lot of it has been you know has been Jen expressing where she wants to see her character go and then us finding a way of building the mechanics to support that and that it's happened a lot in the campaign, actually. I was talking to Emma about this the other day. And, and it's been something that I really enjoy about our campaign is that we do a lot of homebrewing, but a lot of it has come from organic moments, like the Faith Forged and stuff like that. It's like- Or, or the uh, Callie's new oath. Yeah, yeah. Which I think was an absolutely amazing moment. Um, yeah. And that was have. something that, like, again, Len, Len brought to me of, like, you know, like, talking about vengeance and, like, does this, does this oath really f still hold up? And, like, does it still feel like, you know, am I just doing this because, like, on paper, that's what I have to do because that's the thing that I chose? Or is it, like, in the story, does this still make sense for me to be an oath of vengeance? And then it was like, yeah, no, it, it doesn't really, like, and it hasn't been like that for a while. And I think that was reflected in some of her, her character's journey too, which was kind of neat. And, 
then, you know, talking with her and sitting down and looking at some of the other oaths and being like, okay, like what would be a good fit? And then once we kind of decided when we found, you know, cause she told me, she, we didn't even, she told me about abilities that she wished that she had. And then it was like, okay, like how do we, and then I, we started looking through the, the oaths and we came upon the oath of the crown. And then it was like, oh yeah, no, this is exactly what she should be. <laughs> like it had some of those abilities that she talked about wanting to have, like the ability to take damage from somebody else. Like that was something without knowing about that, she just wanted to be able to do something like that and it was like yeah no it's, it's right here we can we can totally do that and i like i fully i i'm a big supporter of of being open to changing those kinds of things especially if it's an oath or you know a domain or or a patron like it's you know that's what happened with finnan because it's like yeah it's like this doesn't really feel this doesn't feel right for my character let's change it like let's let's find a way to support that in a mechanical way too so you wrote an absolutely beautiful sequence um to accompany Callie's change um for something like that how do you go about it like were there I mean obviously we understand where the aspects that you wove in there come from but like when you when you write something like that when you make something like that it's wonderful because it fulfills uh it fulfills part of the story for the player like it means a lot to the player like to have those resolutions um but how do you are you ever nervous when you craft something like that i mean it's yeah th there are few there are few times in a i guess what i'm saying is there are few times in in playing that you take control or you take mm -hmm. like ownership away from the player um mm -hmm. especially in this group other groups might do it more but with you you don't really do that very often but there are moments where you do sort of take a little bit of ownership yeah. in their yeah. journeys and does that ever make you nervous yeah I'll, like it's it's one of those things where like i i try not to if i can help it but there are moments that and, and I try, if I am going to, I always want it to be supported by something that the player has either already established or has done. Like the moments that come to mind for me is like when I killed Kokanee, I just killed him. I took his heart, Velsum took his heart. And it was like, Matt knew, like I, I did that. I like straight up just killed a player, which under any other circumstances, like I would never just kill a player without any kind of like ability for them to save themselves. But Matt had set up a convention for himself where that like this was a bomb in his heart, essentially. Like it was like, it was a device in his heart. He didn't exactly know, um, it, he knew it would kill him. Like Velsum had the ability to, he didn't know how it was gonna happen. I was the one who kind of came up that it was like, essentially it would teleport his heart out of his chest. Um, just cause I just, the image of that is wild to me. Um, but, I also made sure to be like, there is a path for him to come back. That's pretty clear. Um, the whole thing with when, you know, when Relauvin took away Finn in sight, it was like, that was another one where it was like, and that one wasn't necessarily planned. That was a, like the way this discussion went with Relauvin, it was like, okay, I'm, you want to be left alone. I'm going to leave you alone. I'm out. Like, and I was like, I as a DM and Ralavin as well was never going to leave him like that forever. It was more of a like, I'm trying to illuminate a point. I'm trying to teach you something. And, you know, it was like, I, I, I'm still going to be here for you, but I'm, I'm going to let you fall down a bit. It was like almost like a parent would do. And it, like to, you know, but whenever something like that happens, it's like, it, it is a bit, it's meddling, right? Like I'm getting in there and, and, telling the story for them and I you it's always a fine line of like is the player going to understand the point I'm trying to make or or the story I'm trying to tell or are they going to be confused and uncomfortable and I don't want them to be confused and uncomfortable and I think in both instances it worked out 
Um, and then with Callie, because we had talked about changing the oath, like she knew that was something that was coming. She didn't necessarily knew and like how it was going to play out. And I am very thankful that I have the trust of the group that I could throw something like that at her where it's like, it's happening in a dream and it just happens. And, you know, Len and the player trust that it's, you know, like we'll go with it and not try to fight against it and like see it through. And with that one, it was like building that, what that looked like. I, I tried to, I thought about the components I wanted to have. Like I wanted to have her old palette in order there because that was, you know, the, that was the original oath. I wanted to include Kamea because that was the new oath. And then I wanted to include the, the wild mother, Melora, because she's the only one, like Callie is in touch with her God and she has moments with her God, but she's never seen, she had never seen Melora. She had never like had a conversation. It was always sort of more ephemeral. It was, you know, a breeze in the wind. And whereas, you know, Nepi and Kokanee are both very close with their gods. Like it's right there, you know, they've, they've spoken to their gods. And so I wanted to create a moment like that for, uh, for Callie, but in its own way, like how would it be different than how, you know, she, she appeared in this kind of imposing figure kind of way. She's like, you know, she is, basically putting a trial before Callie like you do this like you have to go and do this you have to prove it it's not like a like I've got you like I support you I love you like <laughs> it's a bit more it's a different relationship right and 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 then once she had done that and proven that like this was the path forward then it was like you know you can have that kind of supported moment with with Kamea and kind of bring it all together but yeah it was I, I enjoyed it a lot, being able to put it together, like those real personal character moments. Because again, I get to draw on all the things that the players have given me to like really craft a special moment for them. I love that. Talking about um, drawing on things that the players give you, I want to talk a little bit about the Matron of Vengeance. Um, I, I know there's a lot of things still in play with her because her storyline is fairly new. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about, we talked about it before in Chatwater about sort of where they initially came in contact with her uh, and how she relates to uh, Nephthysicate. I guess my, like, how does, how is it when you're weaving stories of your players that they've given you into your narrative, how does that work? Because I know that uh, when it comes to, uh, M, she gives you a lot of information. She gives you a lot of uh, lore and it's it's fantastic for you because it gives you a lot to draw on, but it also, you know, she's helping inspire something that she doesn't now know about, um, which I guess is like a difficult thing to juggle because yeah. her God essentially created this character who now is a problem yeah. for her that she doesn't know how to deal with. Yeah. Um, what is it like building a world with your wife? And like, you know, I, I think it's, I can say from the outside, it seems like a very, like a fantastic thing to do as a, as a partnership to be able to build this world together. But at the same time, you have to build and keep and share. Um, how, like, what, yeah. what is that dynamic like? Cause it seems difficult. <laughs> it, it like, it, it can be. Um, but I feel very fortunate that like, it's very, we've always approached it in a really collaborative way. And uh, especially when it came to developing Nephthysicat and her, like she really took the lead on, on developing her religion. And like, that was very early on. Like this was stuff that she came up with ages ago. And, you know, she sent it to me and, and cause she has that same narrative flair. Like, she loves storytelling, you know, just as much as I do. And, and so it was, I think it was really enjoyable for her. I, I'm confident that it was, uh, um, uh, she gave me the big thumbs up, uh, you know, creating those stories 
and taking ownership of of a goddess that you know she created and a story like about her character and it, it gave her a lot of agency around how she wanted to build the kind of foundations of the character that she was going to play but she you know she was always okay with me like but with leaving blank spaces for me to fill in you know the like the stuff around Zesperia like because originally she she did some of the stories for the high priestesses but didn't go all the way back and then she as she started to fill more out I was like you know leave this one like because she had kind of a vague idea and I was like let like let me work on what happened to Zesperia because it was like she she's good at also knowing when to give herself kind of an open-ended thing so it was like I'm gonna leave this intentionally vague so that it may come back it may not um and so then it was like you know me taking that and being like yeah that's a that's a good one to kind of work forward and then the stuff with the matron of vengeance was really interesting because that was a moment that was a total surprise to me because of how it unfolded it was like I knew that the Raven Queen was not entirely dead like she existed and I knew that she was in the negative plane and because like part of it was the other campaign that I am running that exists in the same world on a very different continent one of their players came across the uh I I was using some stuff from Teldora she came across the Death Walkers ward and so it was like the and they had gone to a place where the um they had gone to Shadowfell uh and they had come across this like where the the tree of there's the tree of life and the the tree of death so the tree of life holds the lower planes and the tree of death holds the high the upper planes and because they had been dealing with stuff about the tree of life and then they had to go in and find the tree of death they went there and it was being kept by uh, um, monks like Shadar Kai monks so when they went there that's when they found Death Walker's ward like the the druid was out and and kind of through a series of serendipities like it just unfolded the way that it did and she found this armor and uh and the Shadar Kai that lived there had sworn uh, an oath to the Raven Queen to protect this tree. Not no, like knowing that she had died, but it was that still, that oath still existed. And that was originally the thing that was keeping her tethered in the negative plane and not entirely gone. It was just this oath that exists from the Shadar Kai monk and, um, or the, the elves. And then when she took on Death Walker's ward, she became the new champion of the Raven Queen. And she would see the Raven Queen, but she would like, she was always in this kind of like black, sort of like inky abyss. And it was just like, it was almost like the upside down in, you know, when like Eleven goes in the upside down in Stranger Things, like that's sort of how I pictured it, it's just empty. And so like, I knew that the Raven Queen was out there in some form, but when Yana, banished the night walker and like knowing what i knew about that monster and never expecting it to go that way i fully expected them to run away i was like this thing is way too powerful but it's underpowered because it doesn't have legendary resistances it's crazy but it like when it went that way i was like this is the only like this is it and so then having that it was like okay what does that mean and then I kind of had to think backwards from that moment like because I knew that uh I knew that um Nephysicet had been the one who got her into the negative plane to save her to try and save her and so I was like Oh, and again, it's a similar to Rysel. Like, it's like, okay, you're a being who's been locked away for a few thousand years. And, you know, it, the situation is different, obviously, because it was like she did it to try and save her, but you still locked her away. Like, you still put her away for a long time. And that 
fucks with people. And like, she had all of that time to think about all of the events that led up to her death. And I was like, the only thing that she is going to want is vengeance. She like, she wants vengeance. And then I was like, and then it was like, oh, the matron of vengeance, like, oh, that's so cool. Um, and, you know, and then having that out there and like the, uh, I, I can tell you this too, the player in the other campaign, basically when that happened in our other game, she was, uh, they have a sky ship, they found the sky ship. Um, but the, like the matron of vengeance basically came to her and was like, do you still want to be my champion? If you are, you have to essentially become a paladin of vengeance. And she really thought about it. <laughs> and part of me was like, oh, please don't, because then it's going to be way harder to work this back into the other campaign. Uh, but she decided against it. She was a druid. It, it really didn't totally make sense with her character, and it would have led her on a very different, a pretty path. strong path that was kind of at odds with where the party was at. So, so the, uh, so the, the moment when... left, it like it just it left her and essentially turned into a metal bird and flew away. So the, the moment when the Matron of Vengeance comes to uh, Nebdesicate before the Battle of Belsum, um, did, did you think that she would accept? Like, did that go the way you planned? It was, I knew, like, because the plan that, like, that I knew that Nepenthe was going to commune with her. I knew that was always on the table. And I knew that, like, I wanted it to. I wanted it to be, a essentially like a no win, like not a no win, but not great either way because of like how they had, where they were at. Like it was like this is going to be a difficult decision. I wanted it to be a very difficult decision, and that there wasn't a right or wrong answer. It's like, what do you think is best in this scenario, and you know, the party pushed her to do it as well. They were like, you gotta do it. You like commune with her, like, you know, she can help us. And it was like, they, they put her in the driver's seat and then they had like, and then it's like, well, then you have to live with the consequences of that. And I knew, I always knew that like, I mean, knowing my wife that she was going to try to make it just like that just Nepenthe would suffer any consequence. And it was like, no, 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 no. This is all like, this is all of you. You are all a part of this. And, and just having that element of it. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't fully understand the like sort of the full ramifications of it or how it would go. Um, and I sometimes like that because um, I can't predict what the players are going to do. But it definitely was a, a strong inter-party moment where it wasn't clear. And there's been a few of those now that are like and it's always interesting to see how they unfold but those kind of moments where it's just like we've made a choice and now we have to live with it and can we live with it now that we've made it it we can't really go back on it and it was it was the same thing with um with uh the duragar in in the money hole which i didn't that was one i did not expect to become a bigger thing and it just unfolded that way it was like they put themselves in that situation where it was just like, uh, do we kill this guy? And then it was like, it just became a way bigger thing. And that I think that those moments have led to, like ultimately led to where they got with Rysel, which has been really cool to see the party kind of move in that direction where it's like, oh yeah, like what do we do now? Like what kind of people are we? And it's interesting. It is, it's, it's very like, I enjoy those moments from a dramatic <laughs> perspective because I think that they're really interesting to watch because that's, you know, people are faced with decisions like that all the time, like really difficult, shitty decisions in their day-to-day -day lives. And even though this is high fantasy and, and stuff like that, I think just storytelling wise, not all the time, but peppered in, I think they they make for really compelling uh, storytelling. No, it, it definitely does. Um, so after that moment, uh, we had the Velsum fight, and mm -hmm. 
there was the moment where, and something I've been curious of, there's the moment where Nepi walks into the rift mm. and there didn't seem like a lot of outs um, for to resolve that situation that didn't involve her being stuck. Um, looking back at it, would you have, I don't know, given another way out had it not, had letters not gotten involved? Like, were you willing to at that point? Like, I mean, there always has to be consequences, but at the same time, you know, to then trap her essentially, like, was there like another plan to get her out? Was there like, a, did you like have a plan if she got stuck there that they, they could do something to get her back or? I will say, this is all I will say because I don't want to give too much away that like there wasn't a concrete plan, but if you'll remember, and maybe you can roll a clip, but something else went into that rift right before it closed. So she would not have been alone. That's terrifying, Tim. Um, that is- You can find that clip. Oh no, the clip, the clip, yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> um, what are what are some of your, uh, what it, we're getting sort of towards the end, um, mm. but I wanted to know a couple more things. So what were some of your proudest moments? Like where the players not only played exactly how you foresaw, but like made it even better than you could have imagine oh. there is oh, there's been a lot of moments anytime like I, and i'm sure there's dozens of clips of me just like sitting just watching and enjoying um but there's been some like e each one of them has had a handful of really really beautiful character moments but the like some that jump out right away is like one of my favorite moments was after the Valsum fight, when they were really feeling like, even though they'd won, it was like they had lost everything. Like they, the party was wrecked. Um, and really morally, just morale was at an all time low. And obviously like Finnan was, was, you know, heartbroken that he wasn't there to help. And Callie was torn up about being dominated and Yana, like, you know, it was very difficult. And Yana was the one after they had, you know, almost had an entire falling out of like, what are we doing? Yana was the one who was like, we can't go down this road because if we go down this road, Belsum wins. Even though we killed him, he still wins. And it was like, yes, <laughs> like, yes, that is, it, she just she summed it up perfectly like she she saw exactly what he was trying to do with everything that he had and she named it and that like you could see everybody's reaction of like it was still hard like they still had to go through some shit but it was like it kept the group together it was like oh yeah you're right like shit and, you know, they were able to rally behind that. And those kinds of moments where it's like, you know, um, you know, letters taking the Blackwater name. It's beautiful. Finnan, just the other night, taking Relauvin's name. And like those moments where it's like, that was a really fun thing to watch as well because it was a moment for letters and Finnan to come together. And, you know, when they're sometimes at odds, like they're like, there's, you know, kind of a, it, it seems to me at it, like I, they might not agree, but there's a brotherly aspect to it, like a big brother, little brother. And so, you know, they sometimes get on each other's nerves and things like that. And they, they poke each other. Right. And it's, you know, it's nice to see those moments reflected in each other. And, you know, Nepi and Kokanee going to their going to their temples and you know like like trying to figure out how to get in the, te the temple like just such a human moment amidst this like 
you know, this big story arc, like they've just finished this big thing and like those human moments, like, yeah, you can be, you know, a very, very powerful person and still just be like, I don't, I don't know how to get into my own temple. Um, you know, really sweet things like that. Like anytime, anytime Callie calls her wife, <laughs> you know, there's such tender moments that, that lend like, it just gives all of these characters such a rich life. You get to see so many aspects of them. And that's one of the things I love about the people that, that I get to play with is that they each have embraced a character to the point where they have so many facets. We see, and in every session, you see so many of those facets all like compiled into one and it makes them real living, breathing, they feel like real living, breathing people because they, you know, Callie can go through hell and, you know, be so badass with a sword. And then at the end, like, she just wants to call her wife. Like, she's just doing this so she can go home one day and retire. Like, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's those kinds of moments. And, you know, Yana uh, reaching out to her her dead friend like it back in Barmwich and and discovering that nature of her magic and like being able to to reconnect through that was like oh like this is you know you get to see this little part of a character that that Jen has known about for a very long time like this was in her backstory so it's been for there for a very long time and it's like now's the time to kind of show off that that piece to to reveal that and find that that other layer like they're just the players are constantly surprising me with with how many layers that they can they can mine out of these characters it's it's amazing i think one of the moments that really um comes to me is is um the moment with the uh, Kokini scars that uh, the letter yeah. that conversation letters has with him yeah um, yeah i think the the intercharacter inter pc role play is so strong um and just such wonderful moments of growth and uh, of humanity like it's you know yeah. it's i think one of the things that really that's wonderful about D and D as a whole is that sort of ability to play a high fantasy mechanical game, but then bring that mirroring of our lives outside of the fantasy to it. Yeah. Um, were there any, are there any particular NPC PC interactions, ones that you got to be particularly part of other, I guess, than all of the phone calls with Kamea. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> but are there any others that, that really stand out to you that were, or NPCs that you really love to play? Yeah, I'm like, a Clack is obviously very close, has become very close to my heart. Uh, but there was a moment in Temple Philenis after Mother Hade died, where Clack went to Cali and was like, I fucked up. Like, it was my job. Like, I was supposed to be there. I was supposed, to, that was my job and I let everybody down. And that was, I get misty eyed just thinking about it. <laughs> um, but that was a real, like, you know, uh, a real moment for me to be able to explore, you know, Clack's relationship to the group and and how he sees himself fitting in and, and you know, what his role is and, and that. And um, there, uh, and like the relationship with Oftish and, and Nephi is fun as well, because again, it's like, I get to play a character that gets to see a different side of Nepi that doesn't really come out in the group. It's a very different side of, of her that, you know, is very sweet and, and uh, it's fun for me to see that. Cause it's almost like she's a teenager again. Like she gets to be that kind of, you know that person that Oftish has known since they were little. Um, and like some of their conversations that are, you know very personal in a very different way. Um, I've really enjoyed, uh, I also enjoy just like stupid characters like Codus Brundle. Because <laughs> I love making jokes. Um, and there's a 
bunch of stupid characters. I'm there is a lot. Uh, but um, it I also love getting to to play Chi. Uh, and again, for a very different reason because it's like it I always my mom played that character originally. So it's just like every every time I get to play Chi, I always feel like it's sort of a hat tip to my mom who <laughs> loves the show um, and loves D and d and has has grown to love D and d because she got to play with us, you know, in our living room. And uh, um, I'm trying to think who else. There's been a there's been a number. Um, uh, Adonis obviously has been very fun. Just to have a character that also is like this kind of eccentric person that the players now know. There's like there's a whole world going on like around Adonis that like the 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 characters don't fully know there's like fragments of it but they don't fully know and that's been very fun um the uh i'm trying to think of some of the other like more personal ones it was fun to play this was pre-stream but um yana's uncle garmo who had been uh like he had essentially gone crazy like he, he he had been experimented on and, and had like was seen as unfit for xenomorphosis so they kind of kicked him out but he was like kind of a screw loose and sort of this like tragic figure in the town who was essentially an outcast because he just was like he knew something was up but he couldn't really articulate it and and that kind of stuff that's that was a that was a nice one as well to kind of have that familial character that's like you know there's there's good and he was a good person, but like, we can't, you know, we can only get him so far. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of, been a lot of NPCs. It's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to run through them all. Um, throughout this whole, the whole process of starting the home game and then now with the craziness that's happened with quarantine and all the crazy COVID stuff that's happened and trans our transition onto stream. Yeah. What, what has like, I don't think this is anything anyone is uh, in the group has ever truly answered, but like, what has the reception of the game on the stream? Um, what has it meant to you? Because it's your world. It's a very personal, I mean, the players, it's, it's their world as well. But I mean, for you, it's, it's all the story beats are, you know, driven by you. And it's a certain, there's a certain amount of pressure to keep it interesting. And um, I think I can safely say it's been very well received, but like, what is, what has that meant to you transitioning it to this medium? It's been, it's been interesting. My my relationship to streaming, especially at the start, was like I when we were playing, I just try not to think about it. It's like I don't have the Twitch window up. I'm not watching the chat um, because it's like I, I want the, the game is for us. It's like I want to be serving the players and telling that story. But what I have what ha that has grown into and what I enjoy is like, I do like, you know, checking out what people are talking about, not necessarily to inform where the story is going to go. Um, although there has been some fantastic ideas that I may poach, uh, <laughs> but um, more just about that. I love that because I'm a performer and I am comfortable with an audience, and I enjoy uh, audience uh, feedback, um, like in uh, sort of like, how, are they enjoying it? Like, um, I enjoy that feedback, like in a live performance, that sort of feedback of laughter or applause. Um, but uh, it's been amazing to see the community that has sprouted up around the game, and it has been so inspiring, and wonderful to see how much it means to people because I know how much it means to me and to our group like I know how much this game means to me and I know how much 
I love playing with everybody and how much, how amazing I think everybody is. And it's incredible to see other people enjoying it in a similar way. And I love that. Like, cause it, it has always been amazing to me. And like, when we were playing in our living room, the like, I'm a performer and I know Sean's a performer and Adam is a performer as well. But like our whole group, like they have aspects of performance in their day-to-day -day lives, whether they realize it or not but they're not, you know, they're not professionals in any way. And I love that. I love that because it speaks volumes to the nature of the medium of, and we talked about this with BAM and uh, behind the screen, but that like collective storytelling is not just the, a performer's game. It's a human thing. It's such a human experience and D, D gives you the framework and for those who enjoy that aspect of it the narrative storytelling because it's not everybody's bag and that's cool too but those people who enjoy it even just like you can get sucked up into it so quickly and in such a meaningful way and not like it never has to be seen by anybody else other than at the table but that experience is like collective storytelling is so fundamental, I think, to the human experience. That's my opinion. I, but it's something that we have been doing as a culture, as a like, as a species, forever. It's how we passed on knowledge. It's how we like. It's how we taught each other. It's how we connected to each other. And so, playing D and D just gives you that framework to be able to do that. It it just greases the wheels. So it's not just a bunch of adults sitting around telling each other a story. It's like, it just gives you that framework and it is whatever you put into it. If you trust, if you have like, and I do believe like you have to find the right table. That's essential. But once you have those people that you trust, you can get out as much as you put in and you can find whatever it is you're looking for. It's just a matter of allowing yourself to go there. And what I love about our game is that all of our players have allowed themselves to go there and allowed themselves to mine those things. And, you know, I think we were all, I mean, I, I can't speak for everybody. I think I was a bit nervous at first moving to streaming, not necessarily for myself, because again, I'm very used to performing and, and being vulnerable in front of people, but knowing the makeup of the group, worrying that that may cause some people to turn inward and take some of that away from the table that they had been engaging in, in, in our living room. And I think, you know, I was nervous for that. And as we started to move through it, that quick, that like that worry quickly disappeared. And it's only like, people have only gotten more and more comfortable. And I don't think we've ever like gone less than what it was like in our living room. And that's amazing to me. And I, I like, I think, you know, I am very proud of the, of what we put out there. And if nobody watched, that would also be fine too. Cause it's, it's still a great game. I'm still really enjoying it. And I know my players really enjoy it. And other people, you know, take great pleasure watching that. That's amazing. And it's been so cool to see, like now that I've gotten to a point where it's like, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in the chat before the show or, or during the break and, and interact because there are so many incredible people who watch the show fairly regularly and hearing about, you know, their relationship to the story is so satisfying to me. It's like, I live for it. <laughs> It's really nice to hear and, and to see like, you know, also see them creating communities amongst themselves, creating those connections and coming together around it is like, oh, that's the best. That's the best. It's fantastic to see. So I'm very thankful of the community that has grown up around our show and that they're so welcoming and positive and inclusive and like that is also something I think I was nervous about too. It's like, what if we get a bunch of trolls who watch the show? 
I don't want to deal with that. Like, that's not fun. Like, I, I don't want to have to, I don't want to have to engage with that. And I'm sure like, you know, trolls will come, but I have confidence in our community to sort of self-police and, and know what the gravel boys are all about. <laughs> so yeah, it's been fun. And it's like, it's great to see, you know, when questions come up and, and for, for chat water and for behind the screen and for character development, it's, it's so fun to watch. I think that, um, for me personally, the, like I, I knew some of you before we started the stream and I, I know the group main group of you guys were friends before the stream. Um, but I felt that I feel it really through the whole process, um, because of everything that's been going on and the fact that you can't see each other in person anymore and the way our communication has been and the, the process of putting this thing on the air and, and, you know, dealing with all the things that go along with that. Like, I feel that everyone's friendships with one another has grown so much more. Um, our, our group has become so much more tight knit. Um, but then also we've built all these relationships with people that we never yeah. knew about, you know, that we yeah. never had any contact with, um, you know, the guys at we D and D and the, and Chris yeah. at Fable 42 and, amazing. you know, all these people who we've found through this process that have now expanded our community. Um, yeah. and then the, and then the people who watch the show, the people who support us and, you know, getting to know them and, and I, it's been such an absolutely insane thing. Um, because I think that you always hope when you start a process like this, that what you do is going to be successful and what you do is going to get some sort of recognition or support. Um, but what I didn't think, what I didn't plan for was caring as much about individual people's opinions as I thought yeah. I would. Um, not that we let it affect what we do, but it's still, you know, you build friendships with people that you've never met in person that you, yeah. some people I only know by username. I mean, yeah. it's, it's wild. Well, um, and yeah, like they become like the audience, the, the, like the community that's built up around it, they become part of the narrative. Like they become part of the story, you know, like just by sheer osmosis, like that has an effect on the game subconsciously. Like it, it just, it, it affects the game in a positive way. And it's like, it, it's, it's cool to see that and know that like, that all of you out there watching, uh, you have some ownership over it as well. Like you, you know, you, you get to hold this story too and come along for the ride with us. It's, I think it's interesting that you say that because I, I think that really, you know, is the, the hammer on the nail there. It's like, it, it has gone from feeling like our game to feeling like just this bigger world that we are lucky enough to um, participate in. And I, I can only imagine that for you, that must be an amazing feeling to, f you know, we've, we've stories in a world or in a world that feels much bigger than it did uh, yeah. when we started. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Yeah. Tim. Thank you so much for coming to hang out and talk about your world. Um, We'll definitely be doing this again. Maybe this Absolutely. will become a, an annual an annual debrief. That. Or uh, if we finish this campaign before next Christmas, I don't know how the timeline shakes out, but you know, we'll see where we end up. But I definitely want to sit down with you again and and chat. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I hope uh, I hope you all had a great holiday season and could find you know a little bit of rest and respite in these crazy crazy times and. Uh, we will be back uh, on Wednesday with our werewolf, uh, and then we will yeah. be back on Saturday for the next episode. We will see where the adventure takes us. Um, have a great night, and thank you so much for joining us. Be safe. Be safe. <laughs>